Good evening. Happy Friday. You are watching the Extra Point. We come to you weekly every Friday night via NGSC Sports. Be sure to jump on there and check out all the latest and greatest articles, including my AFC South Week 4 preview. Um, interesting times if you're a betting person. The lines have been incredibly whack this week. Apparently Vegas is not trusting some of these injury reports. Uh, Arian Foster, is he going to play? Won't he play? Jake Locker. Uh, check that out. I love the feedback, so let me know what you think about that. But we're going to talk, uh, we, we here at the Extra Point talk AFC and NFC South. And we're going to be talking Atlanta Falcons and Tennessee Titans tonight. My partner in crime on Wednesday night, Zach Law, Despite being, he's taking one for, for the team, he's joining me tonight, but despite being sick, he went to Indianapolis and got the crew, as most Titans do when they go up there and hang out at Lucas Oil Stadium. But we're going to start with Atlanta Falcons, talk to Scott Karasik, who writes for Bleacher Report, Draft Falcons, and a number of other sites, and also does um, a, a really nice... Uh, um, I guess it's a podcast. Now, Scott, do you guys do that via Google Plus as well? We do. Okay. All right. Well, um, Scott, thanks for joining us again. I really love having you on. You and Zach are two of my favorite people to do uh, hangouts with. The, the Falcons. I have been not on the Falcons bandwagon. I really thought that in terms of the, of the NFC South, they were probably going to come in around that third spot. Um, but a very an extremely convincing win against a pretty terrible Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. That they're ranked uh, first in the National Football League in passing yards. Matt Ryan having an incredible season. What did you take away besides that the Bucks are terrible? What did you take away from that win last Thursday night? I mean, one the Bucks are terrible. But to the the Falcons are a lot better than people are even anyone are even really giving them credit for. Mm -hmm. um, people are saying, oh, you know, it's just because the Bucks are that bad. Honestly, the Bucks are awful. They are but, terrible. And they were injured, and the Falcons got them at the right time. But the Falcons are a good team. They are an NFL playoff caliber team because, as we saw when they were healthy in 2012, they went to the NFC Championship game. This team is probably better than that 2012 team. Are Why do you say that? Not? They're not forcing throws over the middle to Tony Gonzalez, so they're opening up the offense a little bit more. They're, they're hitting deep passes a lot better. It's a much more open, spread-out offense. They actually have a running game. They actually have pass protection. In 2012, they didn't have a running game or pass protection, but Matt Ryan and quick passing and running for his life magically <laughs> was able to get the ball off and get the ball into the right hands. Falcons, so, right, now, Falcons right now rank 16th in the league in, in rushing, averaging 121.3 yards per game. What has been the, the success there? Is it the offensive line, which was pretty terrible last year, or are they finally starting to gel and really produce there? I mean, the there's two words that really kind of tell everything, and it's Jake Matthews. Mm -hmm. um, when you bring in the son of a Hall of Famer, you tend to get son of Hall of Famer results. And Matthews is playing like he's the son of a Hall of Fame left tackle, you know. It's like the Falcons drafted a five-year pro, and when he was coming out, I thought, you know what, this guy's got potential to be like a Joe Thomas, like a, like a Jonathan Ogden, just one of those like long-term, like a Walter Jones type, where he's that long-term, really good pass blocker, that franchise-caliber pass blocker. And he really hasn't disappointed thus far. He was out for a week, but outside of being out for a week, Anytime he's been in, he's been holding his own. He held yeah. his own against both Cameron Jordan and Junior Gallette against the Saints. And then last week, he just – there wasn't a Buccaneer that came close um, with Matthews. He gave up two hurries, but both were on blitz and linebackers, which as a rookie left tackle, you're going to have some issues with, with 
with linebackers. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and I was, of course, I was big on Jake Matthews, the son of Bruce Matthews, former Houston Oiler and Tennessee Titans lineman. Played every single position and played it well for the the Oilers and the Titans. A Hall of Fame lineman, as Scott mentioned. Not playing like a rookie, really showing his bloodlines there. It, he's been a, a big boost to that Falcons offense. Before we talk about the defense, I want to ask you about Roddy White. Still having some injury issues. Is there cause for concern there? Uh, you said Roddy White injured? Not yes. Really. Well, he's, he's been... Uh, he's, he's been practicing he's had, all week, and he's going to be playing. He's had some nagging injuries. He's already missed a game. Um... You know, after I'm not, I'm not worried about it. Okay. He, he was full speed in practice the last two days. He, it looked like they were holding him out of practice for half the practices just because he was old, and they wanted to keep him fresh for the year, not because he was dealing with the, the hamstring injury. Okay. So you think that he's fully recovered from that hammy? I think he's fine. I think if they were just using what was going on last week to say he's getting old man days instead of... Okay actual injury days. I'm more worried about Harry Douglas's injury, but even then I'm not as worried with how Hester played in the slot this past week. All right, let's talk about Levine Tololo. Did I say it right? You did. All right. Uh, I have him safely stashed on my bench in a fantasy league. I keep expecting him to get going. Why hasn't, and, and I know Julio Jones is having a fantastic year. They still have Roddy White, Harry Douglas. They've got other players too. But when are we going to see that guy start to get more targets and really get worked into the system? I think this is going to be the week. Chad Greenway's out with an injury. Um, they don't really have great coverage linebackers because Anthony Barr is not exactly amazing. And then you've got you know Brandon Watts, who played at Georgia Tech, who's a great athlete, but an awful, awful football player at this point. I don't really trust Audie Cole covering a lot, covering a tight end one on one. Honestly, the big area where Atlanta is going to have their best success is going to be over the middle. Is going to be attacking those middle linebackers, and they run a lot of Levine Toilolo on the field, but he doesn't see a lot of targets because he hasn't been getting his open as Tony Gonzalez used to. I think that changes this week. I think I think Toy Lolo ends up having his best game of his career. And it wouldn't shock me if he had, you know, six or seven catches for about eighty yards and a touchdown this mm. week. That'd be a nice stat line. It it wouldn't shock me. He he's played at least fifty five snaps a week. He's getting number one tight end snaps in the Falcons offense. You it's know, only a matter of time, don't you think, for him? It really I mean, is. at some point, he's going to have a breakout. It really is. And it's not like he's doing god-awful either. I mean, he's not doing amazing, but he's on pace for... Let me see. I have it saved here. He's on pace for a 337 catch, 304-yard five touchdown season as of now, but that's still think, not bad. Well, I said before the season, I think he's going to end up 45 to 50 catches, about 500 to 600 yards and seven to eight touchdowns. I still stand by that. I realize he's got to double his production from here on out, but I still don't see that being an issue because the Falcons haven't been looking for their tight end. And it's one of those things where when you've got, all these different options in the offense, you don't have to look for your tight end anymore. You've got Devin Hester. You've got Roddy White. You've got Julio Jones. You've got Harry Douglas. You've got Anton Smith out the backfield. You've got Devontae Freeman out the backfield. You've got Jacquez Rogers out the backfield. you got Steven Jackson out the backfield every now and again. you got Patrick DeMarco looking like a decent receiver out of the backfield. You know, you, Then you've got Toy Lolo. Then you've got... I mean, you, you've got a little bit of everything, everywhere, options, pretty much all over the field, and then an offensive line that can actually pass block. So Matt Ryan doesn't have to throw it to his tight end in a safety valve all the time. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that. 
I'm glad you mentioned Devin Hester because I should have mentioned him too. Uh, another guy that I have on my fantasy football team. I've been starting him in place of Victor Cruz, who I might start trusting now that it looks like Eli Manning isn't going to suck as dreadfully as as he was sucking. Uh, the the critics, including me, we were not sure whether or not he was going to be able to produce in that offense. He has quickly silenced that. Uh, Julio Jones has also silenced the, you know, the, the people who question whether he was going to come back from that foot injury. Having that many offensive weapons, it, it makes it incredibly difficult for a defense to cover everyone. Oh, yeah, you can't really cover... You try to focus three guys on Julio, you're going to end up with Julio scoring a touchdown because you have because you forgot about the other guys. You know, you're going to have Devin Hester running up and down for 35-yard chunks. You're going to have Roddy coming in attacking the underneath routes for 15 to 20-yard chunks. You'll have a tight end who's doing well. You'll have I mean, you can't guard everybody. This is the true as Roddy coined it one, two years ago, the pick your poison offense, mm -hmm. either the double Roddy or Julio or Tony. In this situation, if you double Julio, you're going to get burned by any of the other five, six, seven options. Matt Ryan has ten plus guys he can throw to that are rotating in and out throughout the game. That it doesn't matter if it's you know whether it's Eric Weems or. Julio Jones or Anton Smith or Roddy White, he's got a guy that can burn you for 30 yards mm -hmm. and run off a chunk. And when you've got that many guys who can run off a chunk, it's tough to defend. Hey, Zach, I know you live in, you live in Atlanta. I want to give you a chance to ask Scott, uh, Scott some questions too. But now you've talked a lot about the fact that there are still tons of Michael Vick uh, jerseys on display. Are you seeing any? Have you seen any Devin Hester uh, jerseys or, or any of the the new guys like Levine Tololo or um, anyone else? Or is it still a lot of Michael Vick jerseys? Are you talking to me? I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't seen. Um, I don't know since I didn't. Uh, and even though I watched the game, I think I was just crying about Bobby Rainey the whole time and not uh, <laughs> looking at who was wearing what in the stands. I mean, I was impressed by Devin Hester. It was a signing, you know, kind of like the Titans with Laney Walker. Like, I was like, wait a second. Does this guy have anything left? And they put him in the offense. He's done well. Eric Weems, I'm pretty sure he wasn't even with the team week one, and he put a move on Alter and Werner and, like, knocked him down. And <laughs> it was impressive. He was with the Falcons week one. He was just a gunner. Yeah, I didn't know if he had uh, was active right away. I know he'd been with the team before, so he obviously knew the offense. But yeah, seeing a guy that far down the, you know, your depth chart making that kind of move was pretty pretty good. I guess like one question I would have is: Are you worried about the number of turnovers? Or you just think because it was a Thursday night game, which is always weird. Always you know, blowouts. You're gonna, you're gonna brush that one aside, even though they've had seven turnovers the last two games. I'm gonna go with. One of the turnovers was T.J. Yates. One of them was Anton Smith on his fourth carry, which, let's be real here, Anton Smith doesn't get more than two or three carries versus a good team. Um, the other one was Devontae Freeman on like his eighth or ninth carry, so he won't see that many carries on a normal game yet either. And I do think a lot of it had to do with, two, with Thursday night. Like Toy Lolo... Any other week, I don't think he drops that ball, that fumble. But this week, again, Thursday night, young guy. That's that's the kind of error you're seeing there. Um, but TJ Yates, if he throws another pick six this year, then Atlanta is in a good position because he's not going to be seeing a lot of time unless he's unless the team is like way, way, way up. Scott, Atlanta's defense. Uh, ranked 24th in opponents <laughs> passing yards, 19th uh, against the run. Is are are, are you? It wasn't expected that the Falcons' defense was going to be that good this year. I think when you consider the concerns, those rankings aren't terribly bad. But do you think that um, this defense is better than those numbers? 27th and what is it? 19th against the run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they're better than those numbers. 
I mean, I'm not saying they're much better than those numbers. I think the run defense is about probably about 15th, but they played some good run offenses in Cincy, and New Orleans, when they're all healthy, has a pretty decent run offense. And then when it comes to uh, the pass offense, they do give up a lot of what Mike Smith likes to call empty calories, mm -hmm. but you also have to look at who they played in the first two games. They played Cincinnati, and they played New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at the pass offense per game, They've got two of the better ones. Cincinnati's number 10, New Orleans is number 6. So it's not like they played easy passing offenses either. Now, when they play Tampa Bay, the worst in the league, they made them look like they were even worse than they really are. Mm -hmm. so I well, think they, gave up, they gave up some, some yardage and stuff in, in garbage time, but, you know, that's... They gave up 153 yards, and most of it was garbage yards. Mm -hmm. I'd say about yes, I know because I was sweating it terribly sitting there, having just traded for Bobby Rainey and watching him fumble away a couple of um, carries. So, yeah, I was I was extremely thankful for garbage time. the The Minnesota Vikings. It's Teddy time in many. Uh, rookie quarterback. They've got some offensive weapons. Matt Castle, not terribly effective, and then injured and now on injured reserve. What um, what do you think the Falcons' game plan is going to be, and what are your thoughts on, on the Vikings under Teddy? Uh, I think the Vikings are going to be slightly better with Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback, but they still don't have a running game. They lost Brandon Fusco, their right guard, who's a very good right guard. Um, so Teddy's going to have even less time to attack scenes and step up in the pocket and do his thing. And then they lost uh, Kyle Rudolph for the next, what, eight weeks, nine weeks? Mm -hmm. So without his top tight end, without a good right guard, you know, both tackles are playing like garbage this year. You know, Vlad Dukas is awful. Charlie Johnson's worse. I just I don't see a lot of time behind an offensive line. I don't see a tight end to bail him out. I see a pair of good wide receivers with no one to throw them to throw to him because he's going to be on his back all day. Yeah. yeah. I see. I hate to say it. I see the 2013 Atlanta Falcons offense right there. You got two decent wide receivers, two decent receiving targets, and a good quarterback, and that's it. That's what's on your offense right now. You know, after having some success running for Patterson, the Vikings have seemed to have forgotten that he existed. What's it's a wrinkle you use when you're up. It's not a wrinkle you use when you're down. <coughs> well, I mean, they don't have very many options there, so you would think that they would want to get him involved when you consider how explosive he is when he gets the ball in his hands. And their offense hasn't been terribly effective since they seem to have forgotten that he existed. Well, when you have Cordero Patterson running the ball every single down against one of the wor or behind one of the worst offensive lines in the league, you'll see him put up Matt Asiata type production where he's putting up three yards, two yards, three yards, two yards a clip, and he's not really getting you anything. Yeah, he's explosive, but he's only explosive if you can block for him, if you got the open lanes, if you're able to run the end arounds. He's not explosive in the, hey, line him up, and he's going to gain five, six yards of play. He's not yeah, that well, I'm not suggesting that they do that. I'm just suggesting that they continue to get him involved in any way that they possibly can. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the Vikings defense? You mentioned um, Anthony Barr. It doesn't sound like you think so far he's made much of an impact for the Vikings. He's a decent run defender. He, uh, he stacks and sheds well, but he's not the... He's not the ideal pass coverage linebacker right now. And he's been doing pretty well in pass rush, but they move him to defensive end for pass rush. Now, when he goes against Atlanta, he's going to see Lamar Holmes, who's improved drastically this year as a pass blocker. And he's going to see Jake Matthews, who I don't know where they got this kid. Like, I know he went to Texas a and I know he's a son of a Hall of Famer, but it's one of those situations where you're like, man, this guy is just... 
this guy is so good for how young in the league that he is. I can't wait to see him out there playing every week. He could handle a guy like Anthony Barr pretty easily, I feel like. He could handle Brian Robinson. He could handle Everson Griffin. The name that kind of scares me in that pass rush is Tom Johnson. Oh, uh, okay. Because he plays that under tackle. Mm -hmm. He'd go against Jonathan, not Jonathan, Justin uh, Blaylock or uh, John Osamoa. But even then, I feel like Atlanta's got a really good group of offensive linemen that has improved their pass protection drastically from last year. So what's your prediction for this game? I think Atlanta should win by at least 10 points. Okay, and um, let's talk just a little bit about I know you're going to have to get out of here in a few minutes. The NFC South. The Carolina Panthers, at least uh, going by win-loss and the numbers, are better than people expected. Are you buying into the Carolina Panthers? Not really. I mean, you've got some teams that are good, and you've got some teams that look good for a couple weeks and then flounder. When you're playing Tampa Bay and then you get Detroit at home, and going down to Carolina is not an easy task for any team. Um, but playing Detroit at home with your defense healthy, with your best players healthy, and your best players not suspended due to uh, domestic abuse, it doesn't hurt. But now that Greg Hardy is finally suspended for what he did, you know, he's going to – I don't see them winning, you know, more than two of their next six games. Do you think they're going to beat the Ravens? No, they go into Baltimore. I don't think that's a good matchup for them. They go, they host Chicago. That's a 50-50 game. I don't think that they're going to go into Cincinnati and win. I don't think they're going to go into Green Bay and win. I don't think they're going to host Seattle and win. The only two possible wins in their next six games that I see are Chicago and New Orleans. Then they fly to Philly, and then they host Atlanta. Speaking Atlanta. of New Orleans, they finally – got a win. Um, or is New Orleans as bad as they seem to be the first um, few games? It wouldn't shock me to see New Orleans lose to Dallas this week. That, that tells me that you think that they're bad. Is there, so their defense is as bad as it's been advertised. Oh, their defense is god awful. They, they've got... I don't see how that team does better than 8-8 eight and eight this year. I mean, that's, that's what they look like to me. And that's not even me being a, being a Falcons fan, being a Falcons writer, any of that. That's me being an honest, objective NFL. In your you know, opinion, what's the problem with the Saints defense? Uh, talent, I have to say. You know, talent, injuries, it's the main issues. Mm -hmm. You've got a guy coming off of back surgery who doesn't look very good this year in Jarisburg. Uh, Kenny Vaccaro has been... He didn't look like a rookie last year, but he looks like one this year. Um, yeah, Kenan their secondary is not very good. Well, Kenan Lewis is pretty decent, but he's been getting abused because he's got to have he's got to face the number one every week, and he's more of a number two corner. Corey White shouldn't be starting for them. Just period. I like Cameron Jordan. I like Junior Collette. They're a good combination of, of pass rushers. I like Keem Hicks, and I like Roderick Bunkley. They're a good combination of interior guys. Uh, Lofton's a solid middle linebacker. Hawthorne's a solid inside guy, too. But they don't have that dynamic playmaking threat at inside linebacker. They don't have that dynamic pass rusher on the outside. Junior Collette's good, but he's not this dynamic, you know, game-changing 15, 20 sack guy that teams look for. He's a guy who's going to get 10 sacks out of effort every year. And or from going against bad defensive end. Or bad after, offensive end. after this weekend, we're going to be a quarter of a way in. Uh, how do you see the, the NFC South stacking up? Uh, I think Atlanta's going to end up being 3-1. and one. I think you'll see um, Tampa Bay at the bottom at 0-4. New Orleans at one and three, and I think Carolina loses this week to to finish two and two. All it's right. not a really good week for NFC South teams. All right, Scott. Excellent stuff as always. Tell everybody. I sort of uh, gave you an introduction, but didn't give you a chance to tell everybody 
who you write for and where to find you on Twitter and, and your uh, your Hangout podcast and uh, all the excellent work that you do at Draft Falcons and, and Bleacher Report. Uh, you can find me at Scott Karasik online. You can find me at Bleacher Report for... If you go to the Falcon section, most of the stuff there is going to be my work. Um, also, uh, DraftFalcons.com. Find me there. And then... Just hit me up on Twitter. I'll answer any questions you guys might have. I'm always up for a football discussion. So, Excellent sports follow. I highly recommend that you give Scott a, a follow and check out all of his excellent work. Scott, thanks again. Have a very pleasant Friday night, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Be keeping an eye on the Falcons. I've got a lot of their players on my fantasy team, so I'm definitely keeping up there. Sounds good. All good right. to meet you, Scott. Okay, well, I haven't talked Titans in a while, and I, I missed Aww. hanging. I know I missed hanging out with my buddy Zach Wednesday night. So he was very gracious to agree to come on my show tonight, and let's talk some Titans. I, I posed a couple of questions to Zach before we went on air. One, in the bizarre world that it is the Tennessee Titans going into week four. <coughs> Is the discussion actually that Charlie Whitehurst is going to be a better option than Jake Locker? Second, the second question I want to talk to Zach about, and I told him I don't think this has any easy answers. It might be an ongoing discussion. The Titans are losing fans left and right and not filling their stadium. It was infamously full of Dallas Cowboys fans in week two. Now they're on the road. They were on the road last week and on the road this week. They'll be back at home in, in week five against the Cleveland Browns. Be interesting to see how that crowd looks. Why are the Titans having trouble keeping and and wooing the wooing fans? Um, I, I, I'm puzzled by that. I want to get some people's thoughts on that. But let's start with the quarterback situation. Arguably the most important position on the team, Zach. Jake Locker finished the game, played every single snap at quarterback for the Tennessee Titans in week three. After the game, in fact, not even after the game, right. Monday we learned that he had injured his right wrist, was having difficulty gripping the ball. I'm still curious. Apparently nobody knew about that. I don't know. I don't know all the details there. A rather curious situation, don't you agree? Yeah, it doesn't give us a lot of confidence in the coaching staff. I think that's what, you know, to slightly uh, give a premature answer on that second question, it's like confidence in the coaching staff is something that the fan base is definitely wanting to see. So you could see why <clears throat> Jake Locker may not have been so accurate on Sunday. It was unfortunate because they had that nice drive early, and then, of course, Suckup decided to not know how to kick in the wind mm -hmm. and uh, missed a couple kicks there that might have at least kept the game competitive for a while. Yeah, it's been a little curious because it seems like when the Titans run the ball, they actually do pretty well if they're patient about it, but they just don't, and I think they got to focus on the run game because, yeah, I don't know what's up with, with Jake Locker. I mean, the thing with... You know, starting uh, tablet Jesus, as we call uh, Charlie Whitehurst, because they don't use clipboards anymore, <laughs> is um, he's healthy. Now, he's not really – he wasn't really brought in to start games, but he was brought in for this kind of situation where maybe Locker's out for a week, he'll play. Because I think if Jake Locker's out for a month, they're going to give Mettenberger a shot, but he needs practice you would time. Think. I guarantee that Mettenberger's had, like, seven practice reps this year probably. As a third-string quarterback in the NFL, and he's probably throwing to practice squad guys, too. Oh, he's, probably, he's running the scout team. You know he's running yeah. the scout team. <clears throat> that kind of stuff. So Whitehurst would definitely give the team a better shot. I'm not really, like, because he's thrown the ball, like, 50 times in his career, it's hard to say, you know, will he be able to hit Justin Hunter downfield? Will he keep throwing the ball to your boo, Delaney Walker, assuming <laughs> Walker's okay, because I haven't really heard anything. Yeah, yeah tough, when Zach sent me a message when he heard that Delaney Walker was injured. He <laughs> sent me a message. I was, at that point in time, hyperventilating because Delaney Walker was injured. But I'm all right now. Well, it's just, that's, 
That just happens a lot. It's funny how now we're re we're reacting more to guys in a fantasy context than NFL yeah. context. That probably explains the uh, excitement level over the Titans right now. But yeah, it's it's in a way it's like it's it's like oh now I understand why you know, Locker may not look so good on Sunday, but he was completely uninjured the week before, and they got pummeled by the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's not. Um, you're not feeling confident about that position at all right now. Do you think at this particular point in time that Charlie Whitehurst does give them a better chance to win games, and can he ignite a spark in this offense? Well, I'd say that when Fitzpatrick came in last year, he kind of ignited a spark, but he also kind of set it on fire himself because he would occasionally <laughs> have some untimely it's turnovers. It's a perfect way to turn. It's a perfect way to put it. I mean, turnovers are, are big. The Titans aren't turning the ball over and they got a shot. And they've been turning the ball a lot. I don't know if they've been turning over as much as the Falcons. I was kind of surprised when I looked at the numbers. I go, wait, they turned the ball over? All right, they did turn the ball over four times. It's just that Tampa was an absolute dumpster fire. Well, they weren't, they weren't able to capitalize. I don't think they got any points. Well, maybe... I think maybe they might have scored on one. No, I don't think they did. Well, they got a pick six from TJ Yates. Well, that's I'm true. sorry I didn't get to bring up my favorite TJ Yates stat that he has as many playoff wins as Matt Ryan. So, one and one, baby. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, Titans. I mean, we can't really as the Titans make fun of any other team right now. <laughs> right. Even the Texans and the Jaguars, they look bad. I mean, the Giants looked horrible for two weeks. Now they look like yeah, right. they're decent. Are you buying the Giants? Well, I'm there's not. A, I'm not convinced. There's an interesting point that was brought up. They changed the Thursday night games to make them all division games, which makes you think they will be competitive. But I think it was football guys listening to one of their podcasts, and they were talking about how if a team gets on a roll on Thursday night, it's easier for the opposition to kind of just say, all right, we give up and not fight back. So it becomes like – just this snowball rolling downfield, downfield, downhill. It's football metaphor. It's horrible. <laughs> so it just gets it gets worse and worse. And Larry Donnell, who was on my friend Don's team, except on the bench, sadly, he's not just an accountant anymore. Did you see the Larry? Is it Donnell? Like everybody was doing quotes like he was Chuck Norris today. You know? Yes, I, I, I saw great. all of them. Yes, I love it. Yes, he had a fantastic uh, fantasy game. I, on the other hand, had just because he was, I, I needed to, <coughs> oh, Julius Thomas was on a bye, and I needed to pick up a tight end because Ladarius Green was, um, he's not likely to play. On a milk carton, yeah. Yeah, and on a milk carton, too. Um, so I picked up Niles Paul, and. And he got hurt, not nice, huh? He got hurt, yeah, Love I got it. He did actually put up some points for me, so it wasn't a total disaster. He got like almost nine points out of him before he got hurt. So I was all right with that. I mean, I would like to have had more, but it's better than some of the goose. Like Danny Woodhead had like .37 <laughs> points before he went down, and that just killed me. Oh, gosh, it just killed me. So, yeah, yeah I think that's a great point, Zach. You brought that up. If the Titans had more f more fantasy football relevant players, I think that there would be more excitement um, about them. I, I, I want to ask you. I'm not going to call. I'm not going to name names. Uh, that's not. It, that's not me. But I am going to poke fun a little bit at an article that I saw um, that pr that asked whether Jake Locker going into this year could be could stay healthy and be the Titans' offensive leader now that Chris Johnson was no longer here to be the Titans' offensive leader? Um, offensive leader, huh? <laughs> He's not a leader. I mean, did you you saw, uh, was it the Monday night game where they the screen pass was thrown? I saw it. And a linebacker, I think, intercepted it. And Chris Johnson didn't even chase the guy. I mean, he just it was no. in the well, and then he dropped Lost another it. one. He he gave up an interception, and then he dropped another one. And same old Chris Johnson. He's not changed a bit. I think now that he's playing in New York, New Jersey. Now that now that he's playing for for the Jets, a team that has a more 
a higher profile than the Titans. I think people are seeing what Titans fans knew, and that is what you saw. Yeah, it's Chris Ivory's. I mean, it's people were saying it early in the year, and it seemed weird, but now it's pretty obvious that he's the better of the two. It's just that Chris Ivory gets hurt a lot. Chris Johnson never gets hurt, but yeah. he, I mean, we know for Titans fans, I swear the last three years he's had like 50 yards rushing total in the first four weeks. He Then he has those occasional, you know, splash plays that make yeah. you go, woo, but I mean, it's possible. You know, our, our rookies are starting to, well, we saw Taylor Wan on the field. That was nice, but uh, to see Bishop Senke get the ball in the second yeah. quarter when it wasn't a total blowout yet was was nice, and he had some good runs. Taylor Lewan, I wrote that hmm. the Titans could very well make a change there. Now, a lot of people were talking about Andy Levitre hasn't been great so far. He's He has really struggled, much like he did last season. And, of course, um, <sighs> in large part, there's the center position last season was really struggling. Brian Swinkie's, again, struggling. Of course, he's faced a lot of uh, big-time nose tackles, some some good nose tackles. Um, and also, Michael Ruse is not playing as well as he's played in the past. He's currently ranked. He's middle of the pack. He's not terrible by any means. I wrote that um, the Titans could very well you know, put put Taylor Lewan in. He's been playing left tackle in games in the last. He's played left tackle in two games already thus far. Roughly about I don't know 30, 35 snaps, maybe 40 snaps, uh, which isn't insignificant. Maybe not quite that much. Maybe 35. Uh, do you think that we could see Taylor Lewan? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering because wasn't that Michael Ower got that? really dumb penalty at the end of the first half. He like, did. He got, found, he got fined for it, too. I mean, look at Andy Dalton's stats from last week. They're pretty bad, although you could tell you can tell in the football field and a player's thinking, like, when Bleedy was stuck there in the middle and they are doing that throw the pass, grinding he's like, his... wait, he's a quarterback. I can't hit him, and I swear I saw a throwback to a quarterback, and the dude got hammered, but he, like, yeah, if it was a receiver, I think he would have jumped on him, but it's like, oh, it's a quarterback. I can't touch him, and yeah, it totally fell apart, but it was at the end of the half, and the Titans had a chance to score, and I think it was Walker who caught the ball, and then for some reason, Ower came in and dove and slammed a guy down after the play was over, and then Locker threw the ball to a bunch of, um, you know, Bengals in the end zone for some reason, and that was, <laughs> that was the end of that, as they say. Yeah. But Lawan, I don't know, It's uh, he was uh, practicing some, I think he played some guard, and so he's almost like... He did the play some guard. Off the bench. I don't think he in, started center, but he could play guard or tackle. But man, it sucks to think that Lovitri, who they signed to this big contract as their kind of splash free agent last year, as splashy as a guard can be, right? Mm -hmm. um, we might have gotten him on the uh, backside of his career. Um, but I think I they think, want Lewan to be the left tackle. I think Lewan. I think putting Lewan in could give a boost to that position. You don't. I. I don't think that you want. Him, first of all, I think that you have to let Andy Levitre play through it. Um, he is their <laughs> left tackle. Left tackle. He is their left guard. He's going to be their left guard. They're not going to walk away from him. I think that they should put Taylor if if they're going to make a change there because the offensive line hasn't been great. You know, in large, I I'm actually going to be watching the offensive line very closely because I don't think that. It is all on the offensive line. Jake Locker holding on to the ball too long. He's thinking too much. You talked about thinking too much. He's thinking. The gears are grinding. He's holding on to the ball too long. He's holding on to the ball too long and not making good decisions when he when he does. He overthinks things. So I, I guess Actually, we'll see. I was kind of the runs he made were pretty good. It was like that's the that's the place he hasn't been making the first two weeks. He had. He took off and ran. He got like 50 yards, which was impressive. But probably in part because oh, I can't grip the football. Oops. <laughs> that's just it's like another injury. Come on, man. Well, maybe that's it. You know, maybe it was. I don't want anybody to know I'm injured because 
injury prone. I'm always injured. Blah blah blah. I mean, maybe that is it, or I don't know. Everybody I don't know. It's it's that. a very it's a very very sure. odd situation to me. And so. remember that game when uh, Antonio Brown got sent to the lockers for like a concussion. Everybody could tell he got hit really hard. Mm -hmm. They're like, he's been cleared. I'm like, uh, sure. They're like, what day is it? It's some day with a Y. Okay, you're good. You know, it's a, they don't know. LaShawn McCoy, kind of too. Protocol. They were having to hide LaShawn McCoy's helmet last weekend. Um, hmm. He goes to the locker room, come back. I'm fine, and he's back out on the field. Yeah, so that, um, it's feeling worst-case scenario. After, like, a week one, we're like, hmm, they're feeling pretty good. And then it's like, oh, really? You know. It's like me picking Joe McKnight off waivers desperately in the league and finding out he tore his Achilles two days later. It's I like, know, oh, right? I, I came this, Zach, <laughs> I was this close. I mean, <laughs> this close to picking up that guy. I'm so, I'm, I'm so serious, and I that did. That was a Kevin, Kevin Ogletree pickup right there. It was in no way it was ever going to happen again, but it's like, uh, yeah, in a league where there were 22 rounds and no kickers and defenses and uh, bye weeks are coming up, Talk about winter is coming. Bye weeks to the next nine weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, oh, you're killing me. Notice how we end up making every question about the Titans about fantasy football? Because that's, <laughs> that's where we are. Maybe we already answered the Titans, uh, you know. I, I did to call notice it Titan that. I sack Now I need to call it Titans driveway or something, you know. Titans back of a pickup. We could all fit in the back of a pickup. That's Titans we name. We could. We could, do a, we could do a hayride. Let's do a hayride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a hayride to Hades. Titans sit around, football. Sit around a campfire. Sing Kumbaya. That's a sad weekend. You have to watch Missouri lose to a team that is barely in the Big Ten, and then, yeah, the Titans get pummeled. Yeah. And there was no other uh, no other option. Thankfully, the Tennessee Volunteers were on a bye week, but yeah. this weekend I get to see them play um, Georgia, who they played very tough, um, took them to overtime last week last year, so we will see about that. Um, speaking of Delaney Walker and fantasy, the Colts have really struggled against tight ends this year. They gave up three touchdowns to Julius Thomas in game one. They're going to be without, obviously they're without Robert Mathis. They're going to be without another one of their better linebackers, probably their best linebacker, um, not Jeff named Freeman. Robert, Jer Jarrell Freeman. And uh, so I think if, if Delaney Walker can <coughs> at all possibly go, he is in line for a, a big game because I don't think that the Colts, you know, he's traditionally, uh, he like last season he was killing the Colts so much so that, um, speaking of Eric Walden, he tore his helmet off and punched Delaney Walker and got a little invite from the league and had to sit what a game! I think he sat a game for that. I couldn't believe I'm getting get kicked out for that. Yeah. I know. That was ridiculous. It's been just a rough, you know, like calling the Colts Titans a rivalry is like calling, you know, Tennessee Vandy a rivalry when Tennessee had won like twenty some games in a row. Yeah. Because Peyton would just kill them, and they beat him once every like four times, and they didn't beat Luck yet. They couldn't beat Curtis Painter, you know years ago, so that's a good time. They always keep him in the game, I think, that, that year that he made that comeback and they won an overtime, and it's just like, if you do get an early lead, just keep, you know, keep going, and I hope Walker, I don't even know what Walker's injury is and how he's doing, is he even practicing? He practiced, practiced, he practiced in a limited fashion, I know, Ryan, I'm like, ugh. Uh, he Friday night, everybody. Friday it night. Is, I know, right? Um, and yeah, I'm drinking my last beer with with my buddy oh. Zach because I, I know because I gotta get to the grocery store. The, the cupboard's getting bare. Mm. Um, yeah, it's the the Colts have overwhelmingly dominated that series with the Tennessee Titans. They, like Zach said, they. Won a game here, won a game there, but mostly they lost. They've lost, and they have not yet won a game at Lucas Oil Stadium. Can they? Uh, can they overcome that obstacle and get that monkey off their back? I don't know. Do you? Th what do you think, Zach? Uh, can a Charlie Whitehurst 
led Tennessee Titans team beat the Colts, who just are not as good this year. <laughs> well, they haven't game planned uh, game planned them yet, so who knows? Yeah, I've, um, I went back and forth a few times when I did my near enemy with uh, Nate Dunleavy, who's done you know some Bleacher Report work, and he did a back and forth with Thomas Gower for Total Titans. He seemed pretty confident that the Colts had seen their two toughest games to start the year because, yeah, the facing the Broncos and the Eagles, those are two pretty good offenses. But it also shows the Colts don't have much on defense. I don't know if the Colts are like the Falcons in that they're almost like the Stars and Scrubs team where they just sign guys to ridiculous contracts as free agents and it usually doesn't work. But somehow because they have that quarterback, they're, they're good. They can overcome trading a first-round pick for an obvious uh, bust. But it's okay. I have Bradshaw in my fantasy league. I'm totally cool mm -hmm. with that. But I'm so those, desperate that I, I picked know. up Trent Richardson. Wow. Yeah, people seem reluctant to let him go, even though he hasn't really done that much. But, I mean, against the Titans, I did see in the game against the Jaguars, I was thinking, well, they were blowing him out. Will Bradshaw get second-half carries? But they gave a ton of carries to Richardson. So, yeah, you might want to expect that Pep Hamilton uh, play, play calling. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, they got to score points, and the problem is the team really hasn't done much of that lately. Um, they did okay in the first game, but, yeah, they've scored 17 points in the last two games. The Cowboys are, I don't know what they are on defense, but, yeah. Wait. Bengals are good. They moved the ball on them. Even, like, in the third quarter, they had outgained the Bengals, but because of turnovers and because mm -hmm. of general suckiness, mm -hmm. they were not able to do anything with that. And they have to do it. They have to learn to finish. Um, I'm kind of wondering because, yeah, kind of rights disappeared, as my fantasy team can attest, and Justin Hunter's still inconsistent. So is he going to have that trust with uh, Whitehurst? Or is he just, hey, throw it to Dillian Walker 15 times? You'd be okay with that, right? I'd be okay with that. I'm, you know, Look, um, Delaney, and I wrote this. I'm not ashamed of it. I stand <laughs> by it. The Titans wide receivers – have been soft as Charmin this year. And I understand that Jake Lockers had his issues too, but they're getting manhandled out there and they're not doing anything about it. Delaney Walker is the only one who is out there really fighting and and, and really um, handling the the coverage that he's seeing and um, you know, so I, I would have absolutely no problem with the Titans with him continuing to be their leading receiver, which he is right now. Yeah, that, that is true that in a lot of receivers, they aren't open when they make a lot of their catches. They just have to win the ball, you know, my ball mentality, that kind of thing, be tough. I don't know, because some of those throws have been close, but there have been some high ones that they have. Hey, if the guy throws it like this in the game, he probably throws it like this in practice, so you should be used to it. So it's hard to say. Yeah, people are getting excited about the Titans and their uh, receiving options. It hasn't really uh, gone that way. But who knows? It might be Sankey time, right? It might be. I thought uh, Bishop Sankey really unimpressive in in the first two games, although he didn't get a lot of uh, of attention. But very impressive for him. Yeah, Sean Green. I, I still Sean Green's still spotty. And, and pass protection, and his vision has, I think, actually, now that I say that, I think, actually, Ken Wisenhunt said something about that. Green definitely got a little bit in the doghouse last Sunday. Is he out? Is he not out? Will we see Green? Will we see Sankey? Um, Charlie Whitehurst seemed to have a very good rapport with Dexter McCluster. Will we finally start to see more from him? I am going to answer my own question, and I'm going to say yes. I think that Charlie Whitehurst very well could give the Titans offense a spark, and you know, get these wide receivers going. Get you know, maybe get some um, scoring out of the running back position, and that, you know, hopefully that could carry over to whoever starts. Um, at home against the Cleveland Browns, which I guess that still remains to be seen. But I guess the second question is, and, and the last question um, before we have to go, if 
The Titans are successful under Charlie Whitehurst this weekend. The offense does well. They put up points. Whether or not they win, but if the offense is far more successful, let's say they put up 21 points. Who is the starter if Jake Locker is healthy coming back home against the Cleveland Browns? I think they're going to give him the job if he's healthy. I, yeah, it's a tough one because you know you mentioned the the crowd. It's like wow, so they got pummeled by the Cowboys and then to have them lose two straight in the road and then have another home game against Cleveland, which isn't a marquee opponent to to say the least. Could could be a rough one there. But I think uh, White Harris was brought in. I mean, he knows the offense. He knows how to hold the clipboard. I hope he, you know, can hold a tablet now. Maybe Jake or can hold football. It. Menberg can hold it. Um, so he knows the offense. He'll be, like I said, he's, a, I think, a good one-week fill-in. Um, people asking me if they should pick him up in fantasy. Um, he's doubtful to be higher than the, you know, 30th to 32nd quarterback this week. If you need a guy because of the bye weeks, you know, he's going to play. He has a pulse. Yay. Um, see, I disagree. I think you're going to see him come in around somewhere between 25th to 20th. Well, talk about That's the optimist side, by the way. <laughs> 25th see, to 20th. Are, are, we, are we betting? You want to bet on it? I'm not actually asking to see who else is playing. So, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I always end up thinking of things in terms of fantasy, like, oh, daily fantasy in tournaments where you're looking for that low-priced guy to have a high score. That's the guy right there. He could be the guy. Is uh, Tablet Jesus giving you a call asking about the game plan? <laughs> yes, exactly. What's going on? So, yeah, 21 points would uh, would be pretty good. And against this defense, they should be able to get the points. It's uh, Will they struggle against luck? It seems like sometimes luck needs to be like hit once or twice, and then he wakes up and starts mm -hmm. playing well. And even when the team's down 14 or 21, he's like, oh, that's great. That's exactly how I want it. Now Pep can't make me hand the ball off to, you know. <laughs> Trent Richardson. <laughs> Trent Richardson, who has worse vision than Chris Johnson in the open field. So, yeah. Hmm. All right, so what's your prediction, Zach? Prediction pain. Let's go Colts 27 to 20. We'll keep it in the touchdown. All right. Uh. All right. And um, who do you see? Which running back do you see uh, getting the bulk of the carries and the targets in the passing game? I still see a split. I mean, one thing about, I don't know, because McCluster, they've given him too many carries up the middle. I don't know why. It's like, I don't know why I'm they're like doing Sankey that either. On the field. Like if McClusher's on the field, you're thinking draw or screen pass. Mm -hmm. Sean Green, up the gut. Sankey, he can do both, so that gives the offense a little bit of options. So that makes sense, but, you know, the assumption of rational maybe coaching is to call it. Maybe something creative with Dexter McCluster. So I still see a mix. You know, the, the Falcons, you know, they have four running backs they use a lot, and it seems to be working. Titans have four running backs – it's working, but they end up being down so much that it doesn't matter. So you want to use that you know, run game early. And um, we'll be in a dome, so maybe Suckup can figure out the field goal thing, and then we'll be okay. But they really need to get in the end zone. I mean, opening drive, get a touchdown, and you know, make the Colts you know, come back and see what they can do. Put some pressure on them. Let's get some rivalries going on, because it's, it's, it's been very un like of late. All right, let's talk a little bit about the AFC South before we have to go. The Houston Texans in the premier matchup from the division this weekend are 2-1, and one, facing the Buffalo Bills, who are also 2-1. Two and, two one. and one. Are you buying the Houston Texans, Zach? Fitzmagic came out, baby. Fitzmagic. Oh, yeah. You know, when the team's not winning 21 nothing because of great defense and playing horrible opponents, Ryan Fitzpatrick is not, not so good. Um, you should not take Ryan Fitzpatrick with your existing medicine because it might have bad side effects. <laughs> I mean, the Texans are a new coach. You know, they have a new system. They wanted to run Aaron Foster in the ground. They forgot that he was, you know, his warranty has expired, so he got injured. And it's going to be harder to depend on a uh, rookie guy who was fourth string at LSU last year. 
So I'm not sure. But then again, the Bills, uh, I'm not sure how they won a couple mm-hmm. games. And people have – I don't know why people over – they overrate rankings, like record early, like quarterback wins, and then a team's 2-0. and It's like one week Buffalo's top five in the NFL. They lose one game. Everybody remembers their Buffalo. So I forget. Where is this game being played? Is it in Houston? If it's in Houston, they might have a shot. It is in Houston. Because last week my, uh, you know, fantasy defense grab was the Chargers against the Bills, which didn't look good on paper, but I saw that the Chargers had some good, you know, like they're playing the Jaguars this week. And they had a good week, finally, because they held the Bills down, but they didn't get a lot of turnovers and sacks until the end. But I think they got a shot. I think this is going to be a a low over game for sure, because both teams love to run the ball. And you might see a good Duke Nukem, you know, nuke catch for Hopkins, who seems to be passing Andre Johnson on the, on the team. I'm starting him in desperation in a fantasy league, so you have that. Start, he's been actually a, a <laughs> very good fantasy option. I've started him every single game this year and have done uh, pretty well. So, yeah, yeah, Arian Foster will be a game-time decision, so don't know yet if he's going to play. Um, they had another injury that – I'm trying to think who it was. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, they're Ryan Fitzpatrick facing his old team, Mario Williams facing his old team. Uh, w- we'll see who comes out the better. I can imagine that Mario Williams really wants to get after Ryan Fitzpatrick and, you know, show his old team that, um, you know, they should have kept him or, or what, whatever. So that should be kind of fun. And then um, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Are fa- it's Blake Bortles' time in Jacksonville. They're facing a surprise. Is it surprising that the Chargers are are so good this year? I mean, they made the playoffs last year. Yeah, they came they came back after losing to the Titans, but yeah, it's uh, definitely interesting to see what's going to happen with the Chargers since they're down to like one running back. Hey, remember right. earlier this year when I mentioned you know Donald Brown as a fantasy guy that might be useful. Mm-hmm. I didn't expect Woodhead and Matthews to get hurt, and now that they have, he's like their only chance. And Rivers has been pretty efficient, although, you know, if you're a fantasy owner of Gates, you're probably ticked off because they went from, like, three touchdowns to one catch. He did the Brandon Marshall, and he wasn't even hurt. Not fair. But they were, yeah, I think Mike McCoy's a, you know, good coach. That's what we're hoping to get out of uh, the Wiz, Wiz and Hunt era here. So they're looking, looking pretty solid. They've definitely improved on both sides of the ball. So it's going to be a, yeah, another uh, run game time. And I think the Jaguars are smart. They let Handy get beat up for a few games and then throw Bortles in there. They have all these young receivers. I mean, Alan Hearns wasn't even drafted, and they got two draft picks. Well, Marquise Lee already looks like a guy who, you know, may not ultimately pan out because he seems. He's like probably not going to play this weekend. He's yeah. He he's doesn't play. Him. No Mercedes Lewis, everybody, so mark that off your fantasy radar. But, yeah, I think the Chargers got this. Um, they're, they're looking pretty solid. Um, they're going to really challenge the Broncos, I think, in the West this year. They're two. They're favored by two touchdowns over the Jags. I the Jags That's have been, a lot in the NFL, by the way. It's a lot in the NFL. That's <laughs> what I was getting ready to say. I would take the Jags, and I think that – Blake Bortles, an, an anemic, this is what I wrote, an anemic offense really stymies your defense, and I think that they're going to be a little bit better defensively, and I think that they're going to be able to put up more points. They've Another team, just like the Titans, that have struggled to put up points. So, uh, yeah, we will we will see about that. All right, well, the, the hour always goes by very fast. I want to thank Scott Karasik, who joined us in the first part of the hour, talking Atlanta Falcons. Hi. And always great to hang out with my buddy Zach and talk Tennessee Titans and fantasy football. The talk always turns to fantasy football. So um, we missed Wednesday night, but we got a chance to talk tonight, and that's great. So thanks for tuning in. You've been watching The Extra Point. We come to you live every Friday night, produced by the net, by the by by NGSC Sports. I keep wanting to say National Grid Iron Network, which we are no longer. We have merged. We are now NGSC Sports, so be sure to jump on there on the website, www.ngscsports.com, 
and check out all the latest and greatest articles as well as the other shows that are being produced there. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next Friday night, and we have not talked about the the Orlando the New Orleans Saints. So we'll probably get some Saints talk and um, some Colts talk since we haven't talked about them lately as well. Maybe do a follow up to I know right. Due to the game this weekend. So we'll be back. You have a very pleasant Friday night. I'm Sharona. You can follow me on Twitter at Sports by Sharona. Hey, Zach, tell everybody where they can follow you and where you are riding these days. Well, you can always find me, uh, Zach, Z A C H underscore L A W, at Twitter and also Fantasy Sports. Find me at fantasysports.org. Uh, wrote this week about my fantasy relationship with my dad, including a rare victory this week for me. And wrote about what to do about bye weeks, and uh, I'll probably be writing a uh, ode to Larry Donnell uh, coming up this weekend too. So yeah, fantasysports.org is uh, where I write. All right. Well, um, I w I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about Larry Donnell. So, all right. Have a pleasant evening. We'll be back next week. Stay tuned in. Good night. <laughs>